This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. Welcome once more to uh, the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles. Uh, it's coming towards the end of the calendar year, and uh, I suppose uh, one should start thinking about ways to wrap up some of the arguments that have had during the year. But uh, a couple of, you know, a few days ago, uh, I had a discussion session with uh, Rick Wolf, uh, who was really the initiator of Democracy at Work. And uh, we were discussing the whole kind of question of the relevance of Marx and Marxism to understanding the contemporary situation. And I gather that uh, the audience uh, was uh, apparently reasonably impressed with the uh, discussion, but uh, had one large overwhelming question, which is, okay, uh, tell us what uh, we should do and how we should do it. Now, this is a question that has uh, bugged me, if you like, throughout the whole of my uh, political and uh, academic life that people say it's all very well, you tell us what's wrong, you show us connections and all those things, and we understand the world much better, but we, we don't have any kind of real firm recommendations from you as to exactly how one should go about changing it. And if, uh, as the, in the famous saying, our task is not to under, merely to understand the world, but to change it, uh, how then are we going to change it? And my classic answer to that is, a, of course, a cop-out. It's a cop-out which says, well, look, uh, my job is to try to alert you uh, how, what is going on and how, and how it's going on and to you know, get past all of the layers of bourgeois ideology and fetish representations and so on and start to have a much better understanding of how the world is working so that you're in a better position to know what it is you have to change uh, in order to somehow or other arrive at a a different way of uh, living and working and being in this world. Now, I recognize that as a cop-out, so recently I've started to think to myself, is there something I could actually write or something I could do which might not answer that question entirely, but at least go some way to thinking about uh, how, to, how to do it. Because part of the problem here is this, that everybody is in a particular situation. Their particular su- situation poses certain problems and possibilities. And therefore, you cannot prescribe, from my experience, what would be relevant for your experience, given where you are coming from. So it is that situatedness of the answer, because any attempt to change the world has to begin with where people are actually at, and not only where they're at intellectually, but where they're at physically, where they are at in terms of their positionality in society, and what kinds of levers they have to to change things, so that somebody who has a great deal of uh, uh, money can can is in a diff- different position to somebody who has as a homeless person who has uh, no no money or very little money at all uh, to survive. So uh, that's the, the the situation. So I started to think, however, after I had worked on uh, the the companion volume to uh, Marx's Grundrisse. At a certain point, you know, Marx kind of uh, raises the, the, the issue of what would the emancipated laborer deal with the particular situation? So Marx discusses something about the labor process. He discusses something about you know falling rates of profit or rising masses or uh, rent on land or whatever it is. Uh, and, and, and what Marx does then is to sort of alert us to some kind of issue, but then says, well, uh, given the analysis, and presuming that uh, the analysis is good analysis, what would the emancipated laborer think of this? Now, I started to think about the idea and the figure, if you like, of the emancipated laborer. Um, emancipated, of course, in a, in a double sense, that to some degree they have a job situation uh, which is under their control as opposed to being controlled by by capital. Uh, they have a livelihood which is uh, kind of acceptable. They have living conditions which are reasonable. So you could say, <coughs> I have a certain image of emancipation, 
which is which is emancipation from the travails of actually living and working under the domination of a capitalist mode of production. But I think emancipation also means something else. And I started to think about, well, the thing that probably would concern me a lot would be uh, that people be emancipated in their conceptual apparatus, in the way they think, that they can actually see through uh, all of the games and bourgeois tricks that get played, all of the ideological gambits that are around, all of the, you know, the, the false promises which exist through advertising and all of the things that go on and through social media and so on, and that the emancipated laborer would be somebody who is emancipated in their heads and in their consciousness. And I was thinking to myself, well, if, if I wanted somebody to be emancipated of that sort, what, what, where would I begin if I was in a position to somehow or other instruct them on how to think about the world? And here I go back to one of the arguments which I've made before in Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, which is to say, we need to think uh, very much about the circulation of labor capacity, the circulation of labor power. And I've talked about this before, but let me refresh your memory a little bit. What Marx does is to say, uh, yes, the worker is employed in, at the point of production. And there is therefore a moment in the, in the circulation process where the, the worker is, a to is solely taken up as a bearer of labor power, of delivering the capacity to labor uh, into the hands of the capitalist who is going to use it to make a commodity and get a profit and all the rest of it. So there is uh, the experience of uh, the labor process. There is the aspect of exploitation, that this process is bound and, and set up in such a way uh, that the uh, laborer is going to produce more value than they themselves have. And so therefore, there is a production of surplus value as well as a surplus of uh, uh, in the form of uh, commodities. So uh, that we know, and, and that is, a, of course, a, one of the core features of Marx's analysis is to do this analysis of the labor process. But behind it, he says, there exist some other steps. I mean, what happens to a laborer when they go home, when they leave, when they leave the labor process? They leave the labor process with a certain amount of money in their pocket. And at that point, they have all of the powers that arise with anybody who possesses money. That is, they can spend it on anything they like. Now, in many cases, of course, the laborer is condemned to having to, to uh, use that money to, to buy necessities so that there can be food on the table, shelter over their heads, and clothing on the bodies, and all, all the rest of it. So it's not as if the laborer is totally free in terms of what they do with their money. But let's suppose some of that is left over. There's still the question of what do you do if you have a little bit of surplus money left over? And in the early days of capitalism, there were mutual aid societies where people would put in a, you know, a shilling a week or something like that in Britain. And, and, and uh, that would uh, go to help somebody who was in dire need. And if, if at a certain point you, you found yourself in dire need, you could go draw upon that mutual aid uh, fund. So uh, workers these days, of course, are also encouraged very much to save for their old age or save for a rainy day. That is, uh, there's a cutting back on, on, on sort of pension rights, although social security is still, is still there. There's a cutting back on social provision and so on. So more and more workers are expected to take care of their own emergencies, take care of their own health care costs, take care of their own educational costs and all the rest of it. So that uh, more and more uh, workers have to find themselves uh, operating as money managers. How do, they, how do they manage the household budget? How do they manage uh, to keep things alive, uh, keep everybody alive? And so at this point, however, what you find is there are certain institutions which uh, say to the worker, well, actually, you know, you could uh, use us and your life will be improved. For example, workers may be tempted to become homeowners. If they become homeowners, they're going to have to get, do it on getting on debt. They're going to have to take out a mortgage. And a mortgage is an obligation to pay for the rest of the term of the mortgage, maybe 30 years or something like that, until you've then become fully owner of the, of, of the house. But therefore, there have to be mortgage institutions around. And the mortgage institutions, of course, charge. They charge to originate a mortgage. They charge to change a mortgage. They charge uh, to service the mortgage. 
So you, you're you're putting in money, thinking it's going to the uh, to the purchase of the house, but a lot of it is going to 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 actually pay off uh, all of the people who are behind the, the the mortgage business. And of course, as we know, that has become very big business. About fourteen trillion dollars in the United States is wrapped up in the mortgage market. So so and then and then of course there comes a day when you want to buy something or you need to buy something and you haven't got enough cash with you so you spend a, you use a credit card and we find the credit card companies start coming in and saying oh well there are all kinds of ways you can consolidate your debt you know and blah 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 and then other people will say well I want to get an education and so they go into debt to get education so the monetary moment of the circulation of labor capacity is terribly important and what we see is that there are some facilitative features like mutual aid societies, uh, uh, pension rights, and all the rest of it there, but there are also some predatory practices. And the predatory practices, a lot of them are actually coming in and starting to subvert the facilitative practices. And so the experience of the working person is not only the experience which, which exists in, in, in the labor process, it's also the experience that, is, that exists when you become money managers and you attempt to manage your money rationally so that you have enough in reserve, you can save for your old age, you can meet your daily requirements, and you can actually invest in education and all the rest of it. So, so and increasingly, uh, in a neoliberal society, the idea is very much more and more that the worker is in charge of their own money. And if they make a mess of things and they get it taken away, that's, you know, buyer beware. They're the ones who should uh, actually take care of that. So then, then some people will come along and say, therefore, we should have legislation against usurious practices, against, uh, you know, kind of scams which go on in, in, in the money, in the money realm. So... There is the private, there is the, the, the realm of, uh, of the workplace, but there's also the realm of, of, of what, the, what, what the, the worker does as, as a holder of money. But then much of that money, as I've suggested, is going to be spent in, in, in buying commodities in order to live. And these commodities mean that you're buying shelters, so you're going to either have to pay rent or you're going to have to pay a mortgage on a house or whatever. So, so, so rent is, a, is an issue. You're going to have to take care of, uh, uh, of basic food uh, requirements uh, for you and, and whoever else is in the household. You're going to have to take care of uh, uh, any, any kind of medical, uh, you know, uh, medical needs. Uh, included pharmaceutical products. So you go into the market, and when you get into the market, you're, you're operating as a buyer, and of course you have an immense choice of commodities you can buy in the market. And capital is constantly trying to persuade you to buy this commodity or that commodity. You know, you're a bit overweight, so you watch television and they, they say, oh, there's a wonderful way in which you can lose weight. Or you have a, you know, a skin blemish. Oh, there's more marvelous creams for this uh, skin blemish and all the rest of it. So the the the, the marketplace is, is is a complicated place, and there's a there's a lot of coercive work which goes on there, a, a lot of persuasive work which goes on there, a lot of uh, scams which are set up, uh, uh, the pricing of the goods, the pharmaceutical products. I mean, the United States are are sold at, at immensely remunerative. Uh, Costs for the and, and and you know so the pharmaceutical companies are doing extremely well out of out of the work out of the work so so you you then see well okay the circulation of labor capacity is the experience in the workplace the experience as a money manager the experience as a commodity buyer now Marx says something interesting about this and he says you know when when the worker goes in as a and becomes a commodity buyer they lose their identity as a laborer. That is, the way they felt about the world uh, in the labor process is, is irrelevant to the way they're going to think about the world in, in, in buying consumer products in order to live. But then the worker will take those, those products uh, from the market and take them back to some household unit where reproduction will take place, social reproduction will take place. Uh, sometimes there will be family involved or a household structure of some kind, some kind of collective. And, and this will mean, this will mean again also that the qualities of, of that life in, in, in the neighborhood, in the household, in, in the consumption sphere, 
But the qualities of that life are going to depend very much on how workers organize things for themselves, but also are going to depend very much on the kinds of resources workers can have, both in terms of time, because it often takes time to organize uh, events and organize things in the, uh, in the living space. Uh, so what resources do they have in of time? What resources do they have in the form of money? What resources do they have in forms of commodities that they've got? What resources do they have in terms of long-term capital, uh, items which they control like uh, houses, cars, uh, household equipment, and, and all the rest of it? So, so that the qualities of daily life uh, are ter terribly important. And then, of course, there is, before all of this, and the connection between the household and uh, the labor process is the existence of a labor market, that workers at various points in their lives have to go into the labor market. And the question is, how is the labor market organized? What does it look like? Are there discriminations against women, against uh, people of color? Are there discriminations uh, and, or advantages? There, in some instances, you find certain industries or certain uh, occupations which are very much uh, colonized by by uh, immigrant groups of certain certain sorts. So you know, a lot of the police force in Boston in years gone by was came from Irish descent. Uh, so so th those are the sorts of things which which uh, exist. So you 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 what Marx does then is to say, look, there is there is there are these five points: the the, the quality of life in the in the, in the household, the nature of the labor market, how it's organized and how fair it is and all the rest of it, the experience in the workplace, then there is the kind of experience as money manager, and then there's a the person as a buyer in the market who then takes their stuff. So you have those five points, if you like. And so one of the things I would say to a working person is to say, think about the qualities of, the, of those five points and isolate for me the one thing, in, or one or two things in that whole circulation process, which are most troublesome for you, is it, is it in the workplace? Is it in the money part? In the household? Where, where, where's, where's, where's the point where you feel that there's most uh, aggravating circumstances and something that you really would like to see cleared up and, and the like? And so at that point, uh, the worker is in, in a situation of being able to address the conditions of their daily life. And instead of me coming along and saying, well, you should do this or you should do that, uh, I would want to know for the working person to th really think about uh, the emancipated laborer, to think about uh, the qualities of those different moments and their experience in those different moments and where that experience needs something done to it to make it fairer, more acceptable, uh, more, more useful, and more facilitative uh, for you personally. So you would ask those questions. And having asked that question, you may come up with a, a, a couple of things which are crucial. And for all I know, you may come up with a dozen things which are crucial. But at that point, it would seem to me, is, is the point where you start to say, well, I, I'm not in this alone. There are other people I see in the supermarket. There are other people I see in the bank. There are other people I'm seeing in the workplace. There are other people I'm seeing in the, in, in, in the labor market. So you would then say, why not start talking to people about these separate different moments and, and, and ask that question so that everybody starts to think about the qualities of, of the labor process and 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 the, the 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 quality of the social relations in the in, in the labor process the qualities of daily life the qualities of of, of of the supermarket all of those things why why don't why doesn't everybody start to think about that and then collectively come up with an idea that we were going to have to try to push somehow or other some sort of regulatory practice so that uh, all of this cheating which is going on in in terms of uh, mortgage originations and all of these scams which are going on uh, in 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 uh, the the marketplace that there's some it's a regulatory authority which is going to some policing which is going to go on which is going to going to stop the most egregious forms of exploitation and and uh, fraudulent behavior and and the like now, this will then say that it's important for you personally 
to start to ask that question, but then to suggest to others that they ask, also ask this question. By asking this question, it seems to me, you start to define what is lacking and what kinds of things are lacking in the current society, the current situation. And then it is in, in, indeed possible to start to have some sort of uh, process uh, by which you start to act upon uh, that understanding and therefore start to, to push politically for certain changes to occur. What I'm talking about here is not something exceptional because, in fact, people often are doing this. People in a neighborhood often get together. There are neighborhood organizations. There are particular organizations of the, of the homeless. There are particular organizations of immigrant groups. There are particular organizations. So then, it, but it seems to me that there can be a more coherent way to try to define what the nature of the problem is. Because while it is very also, I'm very happy to, to agree with Marx that our task is to change the world, not, not just to understand it, it seems to me it's very difficult to change the world if you don't understand it. And if you try to change it without understanding it, you're likely to go very wrong. So therefore, one of the things that, uh, uh, the, the, if you like, the pedagogy of the emancipated laborer would be about would be trying to get people to think through what it is and what are the issues that most concern them and which need, therefore, to have some sort of a process uh, of uh, rectification, uh, which, which, which can... Now, this may sound and is, of course, incredibly reformist, and it's very small scale. But my point here is that this small scale and this, this uh, is, is, is actually... Uh, part of the process of, of, of organization building that, that has to be gone through, that without the small-scale side of things and without some kind of vibrancy of, of, of political organization at the very local level with just ordinary people sort of getting together and saying, well, we need to improve this or we need to protect that or we need to do something else uh, with the environment or whatever it is, that these issues should be, uh, therefore, uh, collectively uh, considered at, at the very local level. And things should always come back to the local level. That's one of the things that seems to me it's, it, it is, is, is really essential, is that what happens is that many of these ideas get put together and they become national kind of crusades around things like, I don't know, uh, a, a more livable wage, a better social security system, uh, better treatment of, uh, uh, of, of health care and availability of health care, all those things. When it, when it becomes a national issue, which it has to become at a certain point, and even become a global uh, issue, a planetary issue, if you like, at a certain point, even though those, uh, they, they, must, they must do that, uh, that uh, you should never ever give up on the fact that 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 uh, those those questions which should be addressed at a global level come back to uh, actually change the life of, uh, uh, of of ordinary people in ordinary situations. Now, the, the, this is this is one of the ways in which I would like to think about the pedagogy of the of the. Uh, uh, of the working person, the, the, if you like, the, the pedagogy of the of emancipated laborer. So it's a, just a nice idea, and okay, it's a little bit of a utopian construct, and it's a little bit of a simple product. But what I'm what I'm inviting people to do is to say, if you if you listen to these podcasts, if you read some of the things that I'm writing about coming out of the Grundrisse, and you then think a little bit about the circulation of uh, labor capacity, then you can turn that into a series of hooks upon which you can start to hang certain questions and uh, certain hooks upon which you can start to uh, uh, devise certain modes of, uh, of activity and certain modes of, uh, of, of action. So that's one, one theme that I think that is, that is really critically, uh, to me, is, 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 a, is a partial answer. It's not the answer, of course, but it's a partial answer to the question of, uh, okay, tell us what to do and how to do it. I'm, I'm, so that is, that is one, one side of the question. But then the issue is, well, how do people get to uh, actually uh, un understanding the world in, in, in this way? Should the emancipated laborer 
uh, first uh, take a, a little bit of a course in Marx? And my answer to that is, well, yeah, I think that is not a bad idea. So one of the things that is involved in this is, of course, a, a kind of educational thing, so that you see that the circulation of labor power is just one of the forms of circulation which exist in a capitalist society. It's the one which uh, affects everybody in the wage labor force, and therefore uh, there's a very democratic uh, and populist kind of uh, level at which it is cast. But you then start to see the circulation of uh, labor uh, circulation of labor capacity in relationship to the other circulation processes which are going at work. And here is where education starts to be important because you'd want to know what's the relationship between the circulation of labor capacity and the circulation of capital. And the circulation of capital is, of course, all about the production of value, surplus value, profit, and all the rest of it. It's all about growth. And, and therefore, uh, we, we live in a society which has been driven by this engine of capital accumulation, which seems to be sort of pretty, pretty endless in terms of uh, where it's going and, and, and how it's going. But this is, the, if you like, uh, one of the critical features of, uh, of, an, of one, of the, one of the steps towards an answer to that question of what is to be done. But... Here, I would also draw upon my own experience and say, well, whenever something like this crops up and you start to sort of get self-educated and start to pull things together, it's very important, very important indeed that you start to do this collectively. And historically, one of the things that I've always found absolutely fascinating is forming together kind of, I don't know, social think groups, sometimes educational strategies, reading groups. Um, and, and actually, much of the work that I've been able to do in intellectually and politically and all the rest of it has come uh, a lot of the time through the kinds of energy that comes out of uh, coming together with a certain group and having a little collective group which does a reading group maybe once every two weeks or once a month or something like that, talking about local problems, talking about uh, global problems, talking, uh, talking about uh, ways of thinking. So that if you like, the, the reading group uh, and, and, and the thinking group and is, is, is crucially important. And, and in my own life, uh, particularly when I was living in Baltimore, we had uh, several kind of small groups of this kind, you know, 12 or 15 people we would meet once a month. We would start to do things collectively organized around certain issues like rent control or miners' strikes or whatever. And at a certain point, one of the things we did was we said, look, uh, one of the things we lack in this city is a kind of collective space where we can actually get together and start to work through all of these, these problems. And it was at that point that somebody said, you know, uh, there's an old uh, branch library of uh, the Enoch Pratt Baltimore Library, which uh, nobody knows what to do with. Uh, maybe we should buy it. And uh, so one of the things we did was we bought it for, uh, and the city, gave, in effect, gave it to us for $1. So we had, uh, we had this building. And we could then turn it into a, what we called a, a progressive action center. And we had little office spaces for all of the different political groups, like uh, uh, Democratic Socialists had their office there. Uh, the Latin American Solidarity Committee had its office there, or one of the feminist collectives had their office there. Uh, so we had about, uh, we, we remodeled the building. So there were about 10 offices, and uh, we had about 10 organizations. Had it. We then had a collective lecture space. And we were very lucky also because uh, in Baltimore at that time, there was something called the Alternative Press Center. Now, the Alternative Press Center decided that what it would do was try, find, try and index all of, all of the articles that were coming out in, you know, little journals here of the left and journals there. And so the result was that they had a vast collection of these, of these journals. Uh, going back to somewhere like the you know mid early early mid nineteen sixties, and since this was a library, there was a library space there, and we ended up saying, okay, well, this can be the library of the alternative press center. So we had a library, and we started to gather books. Uh, you know, I donated what, whatever books I had, you know, and, and others did too. 
and and we raised some money. And here's here it also was terribly important because we said to everybody, okay, you can invest in this. Uh, we would like uh, people in the progressive community, and this is back in the 1970s, to put up as much as they can, preferably something like $200, something like that. And we had about 200 people uh, did. And to many, we said, okay, this is an investment. You may, And they said, no, no, we don't want it to be investment. That's it. You know, just, you just keep the money and... and so we, we rebuilt, rebuilt it uh, again. We did a lot of the labor on it. I didn't do it because I'm hopeless at that, but we had people around who were very competent at uh, uh, all, all kinds of construction jobs. So we, we, we rebuilt this place. And this became a very vibrant center for education. I taught my capital classes over there. I taught it to the community. I taught it to union leaders. Uh, some of the people in the center organized education uh, in the in the Maryland uh, penitentiary. Uh, you know, the, the, it was it was a very very active uh, center for, for for collective action, and we had lectures. We you had some of the great figures of the time. Uh, like Paul Sweezy and people like that came down, give, gave talks, and 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 it became a, a, a center of abita- agitation. Uh, and 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 we did that, and and and, it, it, and for about 20, 30 years, from nineteen seventy to about year two thousand or so, it was a, it was a very very central kind of uh, feature in 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 the Baltimore uh, political uh, setting. Uh, by the time we get to 2000, you know, a lot of the people who were initiated it had uh, uh, either left town or, or passed on in other ways, and and so there was very little. Uh, at some point, rather, we had to think about well, maybe we should we should sell this space, uh, which uh, which we did. But Research Associates Foundation still exists as a as a non profit kind of. Uh, uh, education that gives a little bit of money to all of the organizations doing uh, doing political work in in on housing and healthcare and education and so on in Baltimore. So you can build those kinds of things, and this is terribly important to do because right now, given the nature of the housing market around the world, it's very difficult to find spaces to have any educational activity. So if you can find a space somehow or other, manage to colonize it, manage to get ownership of it because you don't want to have rents because the rents will fly out of the, the room. So, so there, are, there are modes of action that, that, that people, people can do. And I'm not saying everybody should do that. I'm, what I'm saying is that there are examples of all kinds of um, possibilities uh, which which uh, which are very hopeful in the sense that what they do is they start to actually create uh, the ferment on the ground and 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 a hopeful possibility for a, a feeling of, of of achievement. The fact uh, when we set up the Progressive Action Center, when we started holding the meetings there, and we had you know two hundred people came to a meeting, uh, you know we really felt we had done something, and it was really 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 satisfying. And we were very sorry when it, when it uh, when it didn't it didn't manage to continue way way into the future. And the history of these kinds of institutions is 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 very strong. And I think that uh, building at this level is is I think terribly important. And so there are many things that individuals can do. And of course, different individuals have different possibilities. Different you know. Like I've said, different financial resources and so on. At the core of the P- Progressive Action Center, there were uh, six or seven of us who had some, had enough resources to be able to to carry a lot of the bur- uh, some of the burden and some of the managerial burden of, uh, of of having this center. So we can do that, and 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 others can do it. And so it's it's very it's actually very exciting to do. And and even in the glummest of times, you can sometimes say, yeah, we managed to pull something off. It was really, really good. So, so I, that, that kept me very optimistic, kept me very positive uh, towards the world. And in my intellectual work, I was constantly drawing on the inspiration that came from it. So there is just, if you like, one line of thinking uh, about all of this, which I think uh, 
uh, I would like to encourage people to, to, to think about it. It's not a, an answer to the question of what is to be done and who is to, be, to do it, but it is, if you like, a, a, a ground, uh, grounding of potentiality uh, for some sort of political action into the future. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. Thank you.